Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce our panel this evening. Um, immediately to my left is Robert Atwan, who's, the series, who's been the series editor for the Best American Essays since its inception in 1986. He has written articles for the New York Times, the Atlantic Monthly, the Boston Review, and the New York Times, uh, sorry, and the Los Angeles Times, among other publications, and has edited anthologies and journals of literature, criticism, journalism, and political essays. And he is currently working on a short book on Shakespeare's creative process. To his left is John H. Summers, who's a professor of history locally at Boston College, and who previously taught at both Harvard and Columbia universities. He's the editor of a collection of writings on C. Wright Mills and the author of the essay collection, Every Fury on Earth. His essay, Gettysburg Regress, is included in this year's Best American Essays volume. And then on the far left, my far left, your far right, um, Gerald Walker is a professor of creative writing locally at Emerson College. He's the author of the book Street Shadows, a memoir of race, rebellion, and redemption, and his essays have appeared in Mother Jones, uh, um, the Missouri Review, Creative Nonfiction, and the Iowa Review. He's twice been a contributor to the Best American Essays and twice a contributor to the Best African American Essays. Uh, so I'll now turn the floor over to Robert Atwan, uh, but please join me in welcoming Robert Atwan, John Summers, and Gerald Walker. Uh, thank you, and um, I ought to say that uh, part of this occasion was that this is the 25th anniversary of this series, uh, which went back to uh, 1986, uh, which was the first year that it was published. Uh, and so we decided we would have, although Lauren couldn't make it, unfortunately, people from previous editions. So uh, John is the only one from the 2010 edition. And, um, and the other very unfortunate thing is that I was planning to be here uh, way back, I guess it was in the uh, spring when Christopher Hitchens was supposed to uh, uh, read uh, and, uh, from his memoir here, and we, I guess we all know uh, the sad news with uh, Christopher. Uh, since there's a little extra time and Lauren wouldn't be reading, I thought I would read uh, two paragraphs since this is the anniversary of the series um, that I wrote back about uh, in 1995 or 96 uh, for the preface then is just a few paragraphs of what this was like um, when it started. Um, some of you probably uh, don't remember 1985 uh, as well as I do. Uh, when I began the series in 1985, the world was a slightly different place. I communicated with authors and publishers mainly by letter and phone. Now I often rely on fax and email. Now I don't use fax anymore, it's all email. A first class posted stamp cost 22 cents. Overnight delivery was used only in special circumstances, as publishers here might recall. <coughs> PC meant a personal computer. <laughs> and my only CD was a certificate of deposit. <laughs> Looking back over my correspondence, I see that no publisher's stationery ever listed a fax number. Information that sometimes took weeks to obtain, I now have in a matter of minutes. And I was writing this in 1996. It's seconds, I guess, now. Google didn't exist then. For this year's collection, I reviewed more periodicals and screened more essays than I had ever anticipated, and that has even increased tremendously. The series just happened to be launched in the midst of a digital revolution that is still in process and that is shaping our lives in unpredictable ways. I can recall in the early 80s proudly showing a friend my newly set up home office, an IBM PC sporting two five and a quarter inch floppy drives, two, <laughs> and 128K of memory, an electric typewriter that could interface as a letter quality printer, a 1,200 one baud modem, a compact copier, a phone with a built-in answering machine but with a separate automatic dialer, and a fax machine on the same line that spewed out a continuous roll of waxy paper. My friend was impressed and termed it, I distinctly remember, the office of the future. Well, that future lasted about five minutes. Now I'll read from the beginning of uh, the forward from 
uh, this year's book, 2010 book. <clears throat> As I write this forward, and this was back in April, I guess, Apple has just released its iPad to compete with Amazon's popular Kindle, and the news media is once again abuzz over the death of the book. Although I think that prophesizing the end of bound and printed books or magazines is somewhat hyperbolic, there can be little doubt that with each passing year, we will be reading more and more electronic texts. And it is possible that in years to come, many years it would seem, ink and paper book publishing, short of vanishing, will become something of a craft, like basket weaving, issuing objects to art for a special literary audience. Those who enjoy books as physical objects, who love collecting and displaying them, who cherish first editions and autographed copies. It's also possible book lovers will begin collecting first editions of e-books. <coughs> and even autographed e-books, though it's difficult to imagine how and what they will look like. And what will book signings be like when the electronic edition is the only edition? I try to picture that and I just can't. Earlier generations fetishized printed books just as the younger generation now fetishizes the gadgets that can deliver books electronically. But the book is a handheld gadget too, a technology that once transformed the world as the new devices are doing today. How much will be sacrificed if ebooks eventually become the major product of publishing and the first printings of hardcover books grow smaller and smaller, as some are? How many years before authors would prefer to see their books published only in electronic form? I can imagine going to Philip Roth and saying, Philip, your book is only going to come out as an e-book this year. That's a <clears throat> At this stage of such momentous publishing upheaval, all we can do, it seems, is ask questions and try to make good guesses about the upsides and downsides and gains and sacrifices of moving to a predominantly electronic publishing. <clears throat> I love books as physical objects. They are extremely convenient and user-friendly and they don't require chargers that are misplaced or forgotten, as I do all the time. But as we edge closer to the day when books, as we are repeatedly informed, though no one says when, will be a marginalized medium, I find myself worrying less about the future of the book in our digital age and more about the fate of reading. The issue, it seems to me, isn't so much about how books, the books we read are delivered, whether we read on paper or on a screen. The question it needs asking is, what will be the impact of the new media on the art of reading? Allow me a digression. I can distinctly recall the moment I finally learned to read. The sunny afternoon, the drab apartment, the old faded brown sofa on which I had lazily stretched out, the boisterous tavern that crowded my imagination. This isn't some dubious early childhood memory. I was a graduate student who had been an addicted reader since first grade, devouring books, newspapers, magazines, comics, and whatever printed word came my way, usually on milk cartons back then. On that day, the book happened to be a small paperback edition of Shakespeare's Henry IV, Part I. I was in Act Two, Scene Four. I still own that edition. I had, of course, been exposed to the usual Shakespearean suspects in high school and then encountered them again in more specialized ways in college where, in an introduction to Shakespeare course, we were required to turn in a plot outline for every play assigned. That was a bear. But not until the apprentice tapster, Francis, finds himself the victim of a practical joke staged by the Prince of Wales and can only keep crying, anon, anon, meaning coming, I'll be there soon, to the impatient calls of one of the prince's tavern's cronies stationed in another room that I truly realize how literature works. I had always read for content, main point, theme, the big ideas, and I read in a straightforward, linear fashion, whatever the genre. This enabled me to test well in certain circumstances, 
But as I realized after my sudden literary awakening, I had been reading literature for years with proficiency and passion, but without aesthetic insight. Though an A student, I had been a B minus reader. I still feel embarrassed when I return to a novel I read in college and I find scrolled in the margin, Man versus Nature. <laughs> that was part of the educational system maybe back then. Put simply, I hadn't been noticing the intricately layered network of imagery, verbal interconnectivity, conversational echoes, and dominant tropes that could be found on practically every page of Shakespeare. I'm not speaking here of simply observing certain metaphorical strands or symbolic patterns. Reading literary genius is more like entering an astonishing zone of sublime verbal complexity in which we seem to encounter, to borrow Hamlet's words, thoughts beyond the reaches of our souls. Using the technology of that time, I began to picture a Shakespeare play with its overarching system of passages wired to other countless passages as a schematic or electronic circuit diagram, the sort of large paper foldout that back then accompanied a new stereo set. Some of you people might have never seen one of these, but if you bought a stereo back in the old days of the 60s, you had this big thing that folded out that showed you all the circuitry and how it worked. Uh, and that's how I, the image I had in my head when I started figuring out what was going on in Shakespeare. Uh, today we would probably use some different kinds of uh, configuration, maybe a uh, brain scan or you know one of those um, things. I thought a schematic diagram that would represent graphically the internal circuitry of a play like Hamlet or Othello with all its signal paths laid out to show how any single passage connects to and illuminates many others throughout the grid would be a far more expressive way to imagine what was going on inside a Shakespeare work than the popular blackboard diagram, and some of you have seen this over and over. Some of the people here who have had a little more uh, uh, experience in the uh, old-fashioned classrooms. The big diagram was exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and denouement. Known officially after its 19th century German inventor as the Freytag Pyramid, a model still being used. I checked this out and it's still there. After nearly a century and a half, despite all the years of student yawns, to explain Shakespeare. When I eventually taught Shakespeare to undergraduates, I would cover the blackboard with my circuit diagram. Far less tidy than Freytag's linear model, my artwork had at least the instructional advantage of displaying a play's unique internal wiring. It helped students understand that the language of the play, unlike its action, did not need to be processed sequentially, but could be seen as existing simultaneously in different locations and variations throughout the play. For talented readers, nothing I've said here is surprising. Good readers detect the intricate internal wiring in the works of such literary figures as Jane Austen, John Keats, James Joyce, or Vladimir Nabokov. These readers, as the Harvard uh, former critic and teacher here, Reuben Brower aptly put it, this was years ago, such readers read in slow motion. A good reader also rereads the great books. In fact, Nabokov thought that just as there are major and minor authors, so too are there major and minor readers. <clears throat> Such readers know, a, a, a good reader, as Nabokov said, a major reader is an active and creative reader and is a rereader. Such readers know that as they expand their mental and emotional capacities, reading Shakespeare or Joyce or Nabokov, they too participate actively in the creative experience. Minor readers, Nabokov thought, those with restricted imaginations, enjoy a novel because they merely identify with a situation, a place, an ideological point of view, or one of the characters. Oh, that reminds me of my Uncle Paul, this fellow. I really like this novel. Genuine imaginative writing, he suggests, demands readers with broader imaginations. 
After my graduate school epiphany, when I realized how a single comic incident could encapsulate the dramatic tension of an entire play, I became by choice a much slower reader of literature. Pen in hand, I often paged backward and reread passages when I noticed connections. I read always on the lookout for patterns and structures, my inner eye focused on the writing's wiring. The text absorbed my total attention. But I feel that my generation's style of slow, patient, and close reading may be a dying art in the age of YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. In our multitasking environment, how many find a leisure to read leisurely? Philip Roth has talked about the dwindling core of serious readers, and one can speculate on the impact the new technology is having on our tolerance for long, demanding literary works. Will the number of serious readers decline even further, or will the concept of a serious reader change to accommodate all the new digital formats we are likely to see? I think these are serious questions that we're facing in education and anywhere else. There can be no doubt that the internet has dramatically changed the way we read. People want information delivered faster, in smaller chunks, and with more visual accompaniment. One needs only to examine the changes in student textbooks over the past decade to see the impact web design has had on reading and learning. And once these print textbooks evolve into ebooks, the opportunities for more embedded features will further alter reading skills, creating, I believe, learning patterns that will be less discursive and more discontinuous. In a few years, American literature students may be reading an enhanced e version of The Great Gatsby with background music from the early 20s, colorful ads for the luxury cars of that era, photographs of mansions along Long Island Sound, clips from the various film adaptations, appropriate multimedia links to the book's historical background, and interactive responses from readers eager to exchange insights. The effect would be like reading a novel, enjoying a movie, watching a documentary, and entering a chat room all at the same time. All in all, it would be a far different literary experience from opening the classic Scribner paperback and starting with Nick Carraway's first words in my younger and more vulnerable years. Thank you very much. And now, John will read from his piece. One of the interesting things about the essay form, and I think Christopher Hitchens discusses this in his introduction, is the it's a very flexible and interesting vehicle for um, for um, talking about autobiographical themes as well as cultural criticism. We've just seen that in in Bob's forward, and and I'll do a, a little bit of a different version of that in my piece, which is about the um, about the Gettysburg battlefield. Well, I was walking it with my wife um, along Seminary Ridge on the Gettysburg battlefield when an odd detail drew into sight. Uh, piles of felled trees were stacked alongside the road. The cuts looked as fresh as the trees looked strong. Well, what happened to them, we wondered. I grew up in Gettysburg, and my mother still lives in the shadow of Lutheran Theological Seminary, low in the lap of the ridge that it names. Sen Seminary Ridge uh, is one of, the, of a string of ridges that surrounds the town. General Robert E. Lee stood there on July 2nd and July 3rd, 1863. The woods atop the ridge had made it a sublime place to stroll for as long as I could remember, until that winter walk, which ended incongruously with a logging truck coming by. Asking around, I learned that parts of the battlefield were in rehabilitation in the hope of providing visitors uh, with an authentic historical experience. The National Park Service was seeking to restore some of, the Gettysburg's, some of Gettysburg's landscapes to their condition when the Union and Confederate armies clashed on them. And so the trees that once crowned Devil's Den, where Confederate sharpshooters picked off Union soldiers, were missing also. Hundreds of acres of woodland, actually, were gone or going. 
In July of 1863, the battlefield contained about 900 acres of woodland. Since that time, the number has grown to more than 2,000. The rehabilitation, uh, many and varied in its activities, has also rebuilt fences, replanted orchards, and demolished large buildings, including a car dealership. The goal, as the National Park Service's regional director, Don Barger, told the Christian Science Monitor, is to make the tourists almost feel the bullets. That is what you want to have happen in a battlefield. Well, the project delights the reenactors who uh, troop to Gettysburg every year in pursuit of authenticity, as well as the tourists who come expecting to encounter history, excuse me, less to encounter history um, during their trip than to experience it. And academic historians seem to be uniform in their approval as well. The rehabilitation project has something for everyone. It flatters the left's suspicion of cultural authority, its invitation to ordinary Americans to participate in their history, even as it honors conservatism's fetish for an unchanged, historically correct past. As an historian, I can appreciate the impulse to restore, but my wife, Anna, felt rather foul about my explanation of rehabilitation as salvation through improvement. And together, in the uh, weeks after our trip, we ruminated on her reaction at Seminary Ridge. Did those trees really have to go? The more we thought about this question, the more the whole project troubled us. The trees were important, of course, but we began to believe we saw something larger, a distinctive pattern of thought sweeping across our battlefield, working in sympathy with the changing expectations Americans have been applying to their history. Well, in the Gettysburg Address, which was delivered over uh, just about four months after the battle's conclusion, President Lincoln famously cautioned, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. So it seems worth asking whether the rehabilitation of Gettysburg's battlefield to its original state is really a process of adding or of detracting. It's also worth asking whether the managers of our battlefields, um, not just Gettysburg, but elsewhere, uh, in their quest for maximum authenticity, are cheating visitors out of something more important. In high school, I worked at the Gettysburg battlefield uh, and I imparted the names and the dates and the locations that were, by and large, irrelevant to the moral history of the war. That was fine with me. I loaded the customers onto these uh, fleets of blue and gray double-decker buses, I climbed to the top, took my seat at the rear, and sunned myself. The problem I grappled with most earnestly on these uh, pleasure grounds was to how to pry visiting adolescent girls from their fathers. As for the matter of North versus South, I thought, you know, along with most of the tourists, I could go either way. Didn't really make it. Uh, the main destinations then were not much more inspired than my tours. There were a few family attractions, which conveyed some slight educational matter. Uh, the electric map, the uh, National Civil War Wax Museum, the Lincoln Train Museum, the Hall of Presidents, maybe these names ring a bell for those of you who've, who have gone. Along beyond the town, there were diversions, such as the land of little horses. The entertainments were neither authentic nor inauthentic. They were kitsch. They lacked any clear point of view. And since they were pointless, they were also harmless. But today's drive to rehabilitate Gettysburg, uh, more ambitious in every respect, has not stinted on inspiration or on controversy, as a matter of fact. A hundred million dollar uh, museum and new museum and visitor center opened in the spring of 2008. Has been grabbing headlines, which are mostly is in the past now, but this, this last year was grabbing a lot of headlines um, due to uh, questions about the financing of the of the of the operation. But much less attention was trained on the ongoing effort to rehabilitate the battlefield to their July 1863 states. Thus, this question had scarcely been asked. Is it possible to return the battlefield to its original appearance? This is the first question that we took when we went to investigate. 
And what did we find? We found that in April of 1864, the Pennsylvania legislature had chartered something called the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association. It had taken burial gangs until March of that year to complete the bulk of their work and inter most of the Union dead in the Soldiers National Cemetery. And not until 1873 uh, were the Confederate dead removed from their mass graves and reburied in Richmond and Raleigh, Charleston and Savannah. The, associations made, the association made some efforts in the direction of restoration, repositioning cannons, for example. And its, founder, and its founder argued for maintaining the July 1863 appearance of some key aspects of the battlefield. At the same time, he urged the construction of monuments, while his organization's charter car called for it to commemorate the carnage with works of art and taste. In 1866, the legislature empowered the association to plant trees at the site. By 1895, when the Department of War assumed jurisdiction and created the Gettysburg National Military Park, the association held title to 600 acres of land from which it had, car it had carved 17 miles of roads. In its first decade of, administ of administration, the War Department added more than 800 acres of land, planted nearly 17,000 additional trees, and improved roads. The commemorative work then of boosters and government officials utterly, in, 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 in our argument, irrevocably transformed the battlefield. Nonetheless, uh, the rehabilitation was a major initiative um, in the National Park Service um, in its 1999 general management plan, uh, thanks to um, John Latcher, who was until recently the park superintendent. Latcher explained to uh, Gettysburg Magazine how he could tell soon after arriving in 1994 that comprehensive program was needed to rescue the battlefield from the insults of time. I'd been here a couple of weeks maybe and they scheduled my tour and I went out with a retired Marine colonel who's one of our best guides, Latcher said. He carried with him a stack of photographs that was probably three quarters of an inch thick. I thought, What's he need all these for? But what he needed them for was to explain the course of the battle, because so much of what the commanders could see in 1863 was obscured by vegetation that had grown up. And it was at that moment, Latcher says, I can remember thinking to myself, something's got to be done about this. Well, in fact, um, the scale and the complexity of the carnage at Gettysburg has made it fairly difficult to understand um, very much about it, despite all of the histories that have been written. And this was also true for the commanders, whose vision Latcher thought he was restoring by removing the trees and the vegetation was fairly clouded at the time. All you have to do is imagine for yourself what it must have been like to be in the middle of this battle. The soldiers and the commanders alike, if you consult the, the records, said they found their experience on the battlefield fairly incomprehensible. Uh, their visions clouded by, uh, by, by, by smoke, among other things. In 1885, uh, General Abner Doubleday wrote this. It is difficult in the excitement of battle to see everything going, around, going on around us, for each has his own part to play, and that absorbs his attention to the exclusion of everything else. People are very much mistaken when they suppose that because a man is in a battle, he knows anything about it. Much of what we think we know about what happened at Gettysburg is knowledge gained at a remove from the experience. Photographers like Matthew Brady, Alexander Gardner, and the Tyson brothers, Charles and Isaac, circulated the earliest images of the battlefield. At Antietam, Gardner had supplied many urban newspaper readers with their very first glimpses of dead soldiers. At Gettysburg, he captured images even before the, bur the burials had finished. But it's easy to forget when you're looking at these photographs that neither Gardner nor anybody else photographed, photographed the battle itself, which would have been, of course, quite impossible. But suppose uh, for a minute that the evidence was overwhelming. Suppose an abundance of available pictures, eyewitness accounts that are both reliable and comprehensive, and maps that could guide history's eye with flawless accuracy. The question would still remain, why should battlefield tourists want to almost feel the bullets? 
Earlier generations of tourists brought more modest expectations. In 1869, for example, the Catalassine Springs Hotel opened in Gettysburg on the heels of news that a medicinal spring had been discovered just west of town. The hotel offered 300 guests the use of a billiard room and a bowling alley, as well as a cupola that provided a panoramic view of the battlefield. This vantage point, high and above the grounds, was quite popular. In 1878, a private developer constructed an observatory on East Cemetery Hill, which also offered a panoramic view. And the War Department raised five steel observation towers overlooking the battlefield. In 1974, a developer erected a tower more than 300 foot, feet high um, over the strenuous objections of preservationists. Superintendent Latcher demolished the structure, it was called the, um, the National Tower, in the year 2000, a key symbolic moment in his drive for rehabilitation. The towers enforced a moral distance between the seer and the scene. Accordingly, the earliest ones sprung up when the memory of the suffering at Gettysburg was still raw. But the towers also impeded the, abilities, the ability of visitors to experience the battle, and experience is what today's managers aim to provide. But consider, to truly experience what it was like to be at Gettysburg in July of 1863, we would need to lie with the soldiers as they bled to death, <coughs> groaning in pain, rotting corpses, missing limbs, streams running red, winds swarming with flies, and the air stinking of burning horse flesh. As we cannot know the precise cartography of the battlefield or the movements of every soldier or the location of every tree, so we should not, in my opinion, try to leap backward into authenticity. We should not expect to become an eyewitness to history simply by showing up. At Gettysburg, as elsewhere, the parties of preservation, restoration, and rehabilitation seek to transform Transport, excuse me, transport us forward into the past by scrubbing off the blemishes of time. But in offering us the illusion of authentic experience, inviting us to almost feel the bullets, they promise both too much and too little. They forget that suffering, historical suffering, must be regarded from a distance if tragedy is to make us humble, or even if we are to understand tragedy at all. Well, if a battlefield is not a locus of authentic experience, then what is it? We might say it's a shrine. We might say it's a classroom. But I would say that the trees are important. The trees uh, themselves could teach us something important. As the flesh decayed at Gettysburg, it fertilized the earth for new vegetation. What the Park Service calls non-historic trees, that is, trees that grew after 1863, trees that were not actually standing during the battle, once were seedlings. Since then, in the changefulness of the seasons, they have formed a palimpsest, offering the closest we may come to communing with the lost souls of the battle. As Stephen Crane wrote in The Red Badge of Courage, as he gazed around him, the youth felt a flash of astonishment at the blue, pure sky and the sun gleaming on the trees and fields. It was surprising that nature had gone tranquilly on with her golden processes in the midst of so much devilment. Most of us, like my wife Anna on Seminary Ridge, intuit the connective tissues of trees and grief that humans plant trees on a grave sites is a spiritual fact of great and ancient significance. Homer signals a transition from war to peace by telling, us how, by telling how Odysseus, returning home, found his father tending a young fruit tree. Ovid, in The Metamorphosis, tells of Saparissius begging the gods to let him grieve forever after he accidentally kills a stag. As his lifeblood drained away with never-ending tears, his limbs began to take a greenish cast, and the soft hair that used to cluster on his snow-white brow became a bristling crest. The boy was now a rigid tree with frail and spiring crown that gazes on the heavens and the stars. 
The trees on Seminary Ridge were a standing reminder of the pity and terror of war. Those who run Gettysburg would grasp this if they were less obsessed with authenticity and more inclined toward history. Thank you. My essay is from 2009, Best American Essays. I don't have an essay in 2010. Not really happy about that. <clears throat> the essay is called The Mechanics of Being. A decade after dropping out of high school, I'd managed to arrive, like some survivor of a tragedy at sea, on the shores of a community college. My parents were thrilled when I phoned to say I was pursuing my childhood dream of being an architect. They were just as happy when I decided to be a sociologist instead and after that, a political scientist, finally a writer. I'm going to write a novel based on my life, I said to my father one day. I was in an MFA program by then, starting my second year. I'd recently found some statistics that said there had been a 60% chance I'd end up in jail. <laughs> I had stories to prove just how close I'd come. But after writing the first draft, my tale of black teenage delinquency seemed too cliché to me told too often before. I decided to write about my father instead. He, like my mother, was blind. My father lost his sight when he was 12. Climbing the stairs to his Chicago brownstone, he somehow fell backward, hitting his head hard against the pavement and filling his cranium with blood. It would have been better had some of this blood seeped out, alerting him to seek medical attention. But when the area of impact did no more than swell a little and throb, he tended to himself by applying two cubes of ice and eating six peanut butter cookies. He did not tell anyone about the injury. He also did not mention the two weeks of headaches that followed, the month of dizzy spells, or the fact that the world was growing increasingly, terrifyingly dim. His mother had died of cancer four years earlier. His alcoholic father was rarely around. So at home, my father only had to conceal his condition from his grandmother, Mama Alice, who herself could barely see past her cataracts, and his three older brothers and sister, who had historically paid him little attention. His grades at school suffered, but his teachers believed him when he said his discovery of girls was the cause. He spent less and less time with his friends, gave up baseball altogether, and took to walking with the aid of a tree branch. In this way, his weakening vision remained undetected for three months until, one morning at breakfast, things fell apart. Mama Alice greeted him at the table as he sat. She was by the stove, he knew, from the location of her voice. As he listened to her approach, he averted his face. She put a plate in front of him and another to his right, where she always sat. She pulled a chair beneath her. He reached for his fork accidentally knocking it off the table. When several seconds had passed and he'd made no move, Mama Alice reminded him that forks couldn't fly. He took a deep breath and reached down to his left, knowing that to find a utensil would be a stroke of good fortune, since he couldn't even see the floor. After a few seconds of sweeping his fingers against the cool hardwood, he sat back up. There was fear in Mama Alice's voice when she asked him what was wrong. There was fear in his when he said he couldn't see. He confessed everything then, eager, like a serial killer at last confronted with the evidence of his crime, to have the details of his awful secret revealed. And when pressed about why he hadn't said anything sooner, he mentioned his master plan. He would make his sight get better by ignoring, as much as possible, the fact that it was getting worse. For gutting out his fading vision in silence, Mama Alice called him brave. His father called him a fool. His teachers called him a liar. His astonished friends and siblings called him Merlin. The doctors called him lucky. The damage was reversible, they said, because the clocks that had formed done and now pressed against his occipital, occipital lobes could be removed. But they were wrong. Those calcified pools of blood were in precarious locations and could not be excised, 
without immediate paralysis or worse. The surgeons inserted a metal plate. My father never knew why and later told Mama Alice that the clots would continue to grow, not only destroying the little sight he had left, but also killing him. They gave him one more year to live, but they were wrong again. They were wrong too in not predicting the seizures. He'd have them the rest of his life, internal earthquakes that toppled his body and pitched it violently across the floor. I remember these scenes vividly. As a young child, I would cower with my siblings at a safe distance while my mother, her body clamped on top of my father's, tried to put medicine in his mouth without losing a finger or before he chewed off his tongue. My father was a big man in those days, bloated on fried food and schlitz. One wrong move of his massive body would have caused my mother great harm, but she rode him expertly, desperately, or cro a crocodile hunter on the back of her prey. I expected one of those attacks to be fatal, but their damage would be done over five decades rather than all at once, slowly and insidiously eroding his brain like water over stone. So we knew it was an Alzheimer's when he began forgetting the people and things that mattered and remembering the trivia of his youth. He knew it too. That's why, at the age of 55, he retired from teaching, moved with my mother to an apartment in the suburbs, and waited like we all waited for the rest of his mind to wash away. By the time I started teaching, when he was in his mid-sixties, he had forgotten us all. According to the American Foundation for the Blind, every seven minutes someone in this country will become blind or visually impaired. There are 1.3 million blind people in the United States. Less than half of the blind complete high school, and only 30% of working age blind adults are employed. For African Americans, who make up nearly 20% of this population, despite being only 12% of the population at large, the statistics are even bleaker. There are no reliable statistics for the number of unemployed blind prior to the 1960s, but some estimates put it as high as 95%. Most parents of blind children then had low expectations, hoping only that they would find some more useful role to play in society than selling pencils on street corners or playing a harmonica in some subway station, accompanied by a bored, though fateful basset hound. Usually the blind were simply kept at home. Mama Alice expected to keep my father home for just a year, but even that was one year too many. She was elderly, diabetic, arthritic, and still mourning for her daughter and other accumulated losses. Now she had to care for a blind boy who spent his days crying, or when his spirits lifted, smashing things in his room. His school had expelled him, his friends had fled, and his sister and brothers had not been moved by his handicap to develop an interest in his affairs. And so, on the second anniversary of his predicted death, Mama Alice packed up his things, kissed him goodbye, implored him to summon more bravery, and sent him to jail. Thank you. So you're giving us an opportunity to be humble, is that it? Either way. <laughs> um, you want to take this one? Yeah, you, you can start. I'll follow up. <laughs> I, I, I don't, um, you know, there, there, there are a tremendous number of very fine essays published every year. I, 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 yes. I, I should be clear. I meant your own essays. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, I was hoping that's what you meant. But, uh, I will say that uh, the, this essay, uh, my essay on, on, on what's happening at Gettysburg is, I was delighted that it was included, but it was a failure in a very important way, um, which is to say that the essay was a protest against an ongoing project, against a policy decision. The essay has had no effect whatsoever. Um, so uh, the, the best one can hope for in a situation like this is that um, you know, an essay can continue to raise questions and 
um, values, assert values against um, a policy that c continues implacably against all, any essay that would be written against it. I, I got a lot of hateful emails from reenactors, but the Park Service didn't, didn't, didn't condescend to take any notice. Um, I will say that John Latcher, the superintendent of the National Park Service at Gettysburg, of the G Gettysburg National Military Park, is no longer the superintendent, but um, this will give you an indication of what gets things moving uh, in, in the government. He was, um, there was an investigation by the Department of Interior's Inspector, Inspector, General's, Inspector General's office into the financing of the new visitor center. And in the course of the investigation, they seized his computer, and they found in his computer hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pornographic images that he had downloaded from the internet, included, including some fairly awful you know, um, images, allegedly, of bestiality and so on. For this, they transferred him. I was happy that he was out of there. Nevertheless, my essay had nothing to do with it, and the rehabilitation goes on, so. Gerald? Oh. Pardon me? In your essay, you say that if it's pointless, it's harmless. Is it really so harmless? Well, harmless, relatively, relatively speak, re relative to deforestation. I, I would have, you know, I would prefer a number of land of little horses, and other kind of entertainments to uprooting beautiful old trees. So. You want to? Sure. Um, it is my great hope that the day will arrive when I can be upset that one of my essays was chosen over a different essay for Best American Essays. So no, I'm, I'm pleased uh, and honored to be in this anthology whenever it happens, and, um, and I hope it happens again. <laughs> Bob? <laughs> yes. yes, I'm being put on the spot here, I, I, I see. Well, Gerald usually has uh, uh, you know, a seat in different periodicals, a few essays a year. I, I have a, uh, I try my best each year. I send 100 essays, selections, to the, whoever is guest editor. And, um, and often, the same writer will have three or four essays published that year. This usually happens when there's a collection coming out and the essays are all going into various journals being printed before the publication of the collection. And I, since I started this, I don't like sending multiple essays of the same writer to the guest editor. I, I have to pick one, uh, and I'm going to only send one. Now, that's not always the case. Uh, you know, uh, years ago, John Updike, I thought, had two splendid essays, and I sent both of them to Susan Sontag, and she said, I want both of them in the book. And I said, well, no one else has ever been in twice. She said, no, I want both of these in the book. Let's do it that way. And I said, sure, there's no rule against it. But um, then she also wanted her son in the book as well. And uh, so we, we agreed on that since David Reef is a wonderful writer. Uh, so, I, so I often have to choose um, one, you know, one essay of several and try to make, I, I try to calculate which one might be most appealing to the to the guest editor based on topic or, or length or other considerations. Yeah? Uh, one thing that we've been kind of uh, uh, talking about is, uh, number one, the dominance of the personal voice in, in, in a lot of the essays, uh, and also uh, the lack of overt theses, in, in which you know, is a breath of fresh air, of course, but students are very used to looking for theses and argument. And um, I wonder if you could, um, shed some light on, on the question of, uh, uh, for us, um, what makes a personal narrative an essay? In other words, what's that, that difference? Uh, and what, when, is it, when is a personal narrative just a personal narrative? And when does it become an essay? Mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, there's a, there's two books can be probably written on, on that. I mean, people have, have addressed it. Uh, I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I find that they are, when E.B. White writes a personal narrative, often it's an essay, it's a narrative essay. Uh, when someone starts a personal essay that's considered, they're thinking of doing a memoir, 
it's often not an essay, it's just a piece of narrative prose that doesn't have a, a kind of essayist shape uh, to it. Um, and that's why I think a lot of um, pieces that are, that are parts of memoirs that appear in uh, periodicals over time, to my mind, are not necessarily uh, Essays. There, it, that that's why the the term creative nonfiction got coined. <laughs> I think, it, although that term doesn't really solve anything. Um, but I like to pass this. Gerald is someone who writes first person narrative uh, almost always, and um, I'd like to hear your take on this. Okay. Um, you, and you teach this as well. So. I do. And now um, let's see if I can prove that. <laughs> Uh, I think an essay is a personal essay when it, when the content can move beyond the author and begin to include the readers. And so when it stops reading like a diary, something intended only for the person who's composing it, and can somehow start to connect in some universal way to the reader. And so my essay, for instance, about my dad losing his sight um, is on its surface about a man losing his sight. Beyond that, it is about a son who's mourning for his dad it's about uh, a father who is struggling to make sense of his life and a son who's trying to struggle, who is struggling to make sense of his and his father's life. And so it's about family. And the more you can have your essay rise above itself, where all of the universal themes reside, family, love, longing, then it becomes a personal essay and stops merely being a piece of um, a, a, a chronicle of someone's experience, which is self-contained and often only interesting to the person doing the writing. I think that's well put. When, I, when I'm looking at narratives, I'm uh, and judging them uh, to send out, uh, you know, Virginia Woolf once said that uh, a good essay has, you know, it, it, at its backbone, some idea. And I like to see some subject uh, you know, I, you know I, I'm sure that John could have written the entire essay. He grew up in Gettysburg, uh, not dealing so much with the subject, but with his childhood in Gettysburg and looking at, at the trees. Uh, Who but, do I read that? <laughs> right, but, but he, he put his personal experience, he begins the essay with being there with his wife in, in Gettysburg. Um, and so there's that backbone of an idea, which I like to see. Uh, personal essays that are, you know, seven or eight pages, and there's nothing there other than I, 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 I did this, I went here, I did this, and often in the most pedestrian of, of fashions. I mean, I can't tell you how many essays, so-called essays, I look at in periodicals over the year, and I, I've come up with the my uh, paradigm passage is one paragraph. Uh, I can't repeat it here, but it's a, it's a c composite of every bad piece of writing I've ever seen. And it goes something like this. Um, uh, that night after arguing with, with my wife, I pulled out of the driveway and I drove to my parents' house in Heightstown, New Jersey. I went down Route 138 and uh, turned off at exit nine where I usually made my exit and drove to my parents' driveway, and I parked the car in front, and I waited nervously while... <laughs> and it's no coincidence to me that the, as I realized when I began the series, that the rise of the memoir as a popular form of art coincided with the development of the keyboard. You just type, as uh, what was it, Truman Capote said that he, he I, I thought it was very unfair because I love Kerouac's On the Road, but he said it wasn't writing, it was typing. And I think that a lot of these, the personal essays that don't go anywhere are, I just call keyboarding, and um, that they just don't add up to much. But uh, would you like to say anything on the uh, subject of ideas? Um, <laughs> I'm, well, I'm curious to just ask you, based on what you just said, do you select from magazines that are only online or or blogs uh, do you read them in the spirit I, I see, of selecting for these or is there's so much i see some of the major literary magazines online but um, most of the magazines i see are sent to me submissions of the, the i find most of the really quality essays are in literary periodicals 
like Antioch Review or Kenyon Review or Georgia Review, Gettysburg Review. These are the prime. But, um, but I look at New Republic, where your essay appeared all the time, because even though they don't do a lot of self-contained essays, they do. So I don't want to miss those. Uh, uh, Gerald, what, your essay was in mechanics was? Um, the Missouri Review. Missouri Review, right. And that's a really excellent review. Uh, but those are usually the sources. But the blogs, are, you know, I, 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 I'd have to clone myself into about five people to catch all the stuff on the internet. But I do look at things that are, and, and I ask in the, each edition of the book, I ask editors who are working with online magazines to send me their contributions. Uh, but I don't give them my email address because I don't want all the submissions coming to me in huge documents. So I just ask that they be sent in, in print form. The New Yorker in your earlier um, editions in so many, so often prevailed in terms of, of the choices that were made. I mean, I can remember some years when the New Yorker was almost every other, you know, <laughs> if not quite every other piece. And I've noticed recently the, um, the, the descendancy, of, as it were, of the New Yorker um, as, as, a, as, a, as a selection or choice in terms of authors. Could you comment on what you've noticed about that particular magazine or whether you have anything you, would, you could say about that? Well, the New Yorker became, um, at a certain point, I mean, if anyone, this is my personal opinion, I think the humor stinks now in the New Yorker. It used to be so good. David Sedaris is great, but he's not an old, he doesn't do a humor column for them. He does personal writing. Uh, the humor's awful. You find only one story. You used to be, get three or four short stories well, back in the day. Uh, and they became very news-oriented and topical, much more so than they used to be. Uh, this tendency started when Tina Brown uh, took over, and uh, it's gotten slightly better, but the, the New Yorker is, just, is no longer a, a major source of the personal essay. Uh, and when you do find personal essays in the New Yorker, they're often... Um, excerpts from forthcoming books, just as they often are in the Atlantic. Uh, so th th to my mind, the, the New Yorker has really, you know, they shifted gears and they decided, as the Atlantic Monthly did, to become a much more topically driven magazine. Uh, so I, I don't read as much of the, uh, you know, I, I, I get, go through it every issue and uh, I look at all the cartoons. Um, I wish, sometimes I wish I did Best American Cartoons and I could really enjoy myself. But they're still great there. Um, but the talk, of the, ta the, the talk sections aren't even as, as essayistic as they used to be. You used to find little vignettes. Uh, I think Ted Hoagland used to write small things. And, uh, and there used to be pieces. I don't know if anyone reads the New York Times uh, op-ed column, but Verlin Klinkenborg writes these little sketches that are lovely. Uh, they're too short to be essays, but uh, uh, I, I've often thought of maybe accumulating eight or nine of them and putting them all together in, in, in the volume. Uh, but New Yorker used to do more, more of that. They're, they're so topic. They got very politicized, I don't know when, and um, they've changed very much. But anyone want to comment on? I want to hear this question it's, from this yeah. young lady. Is another question? It's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I was wondering how you um, pick the stories because they are like such a wide range of essays, and I was wondering how like you pick those essays, like because some of them are more personal than others, and I was wondering your yeah, thought process of picking them. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a, a, you know, if someone else were doing this, I'm sure they would have different candidates uh, each year. Um, there'd be so many permutations. I look for uh, pieces that are not overly long, uh, that have a real personal voice, and at the same time have some, what Virginia Woolf said, the backbone of an idea. So when, when I see something, and I don't see a lot, I mean, I think in the course of a year, there may be, it's not like there are so many short stories, or I would never want to do best American poetry because there must be a million poems published every year. But I think I probably, uh, I imagine there are not more than 100 really genuine essays. And I'm being a genuine essay, an essay that, you know, is, is stands alone, that has that voice, that you can say, oh, this is an essay. Uh, it's, it's not a news item. 
Uh, and, and you get tipped off by things. If I start reading something, it looks like an essay, and I see acronyms all over the place, the NCAA or the NPP, or the, this, then I, uh, you know, and I see numbers and dates, uh, statistics, then I know I'm not in the world of the essay anymore, I'm in the world of the article. Uh, so I, you know, that, that's just a, a tip off. Uh, but I'm, I'm generally looking for things that are within that realm. So most of the books probably show a very similar type of essay unless the guest editor uh, is someone who comes from a more journalistic background or has different things and he's, he's selecting different things because I, I always give them free reign uh, in, uh, in, in their choices. Are we, maybe one more question? Does anyone have? Uh, okay, in the center. to talk about your anthology versus the best creative nonfiction mm -hmm. anthology. And I wondered if you had anything to say about why um, Lee Goodkind felt the need to come up with this new anthology. I think it's a result of you know, sort of a change in the genre. There's the whole issue of naming and what's an essay and what's creative nonfiction. So I wondered if um, you had any thoughts about sort of essay versus his collection, we talked a lot about the nature of polish and how um, Best American Essays is more of, more of like a New Yorker voice and sort of a more polished um, canonical voice, whereas Best Creative Nonfiction has more of the blogs and the informal mm -hmm. and... Um, and also unpublished pieces can yes. be there too. Yes, yep. and then we noticed too that, I think it was in 2008, there was an essay that appeared in both, it was uh, Cracking Open, I think mm -hmm. was called. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted, I wanted to hear your take on um, sort of this digression of the genre. Mm -hmm. Well, he, creative nonfiction, the journal goes back far, so he was taking things and, you know, doing this uh, annual. But we're, we're sort of different, and uh, there's more of a, I guess, uh, what I was saying before. He, um, Lee, I mean, first of all, uh, I, I've never done the numbers, but I would imagine in these anthologies, uh, 60 to 70 pieces have to do with medical reporting or something like that. He's, he's got this, you know, fixation on that subject. Uh, but a lot of his stuff are, he is more inclined to do the kind of memoir narrative uh, that fell in the back uh, at Stonehill, I guess, was referring to that I don't consider essays. So there, there is that uh, differentiation that we, we both make. Now every now and then um, something will fall between and maybe we'll both choose the same thing. But he, he's looking at more of, of and, and he's also, he, I, he, he doesn't have the same restrictions I have and one of them is that every piece must have been published uh, somewhere and I, and I am privileging uh, a lot more print magazines probably than than he is, and I just, I just because I find there's more quality work uh, there, and it's more accessible for me. Uh, but things are changing, as I mentioned in my my talk, and uh, we're as we move more and more toward to its more electronic publishing. I mean, I'll I'll be cer certainly, you know, looking for essays in those places as well. As a young writer, I sort of appreciate best creative nonfiction because I think there tend to be younger writers in there. However, I think. As a model, best uh, best American essays is better for a young writer to learn because they yeah. are, I think, not always better, but it's, yeah. it's more it's in a more experienced voice. Well, I have a problem. My, my biggest problem is that it's hard enough to know what an essay is. I certainly don't know what creative nonfiction is. Uh, I you know when I started this, I had trouble. I, I've never come up with a definition of the essay, but creative nonfiction seems to me uh, almost oxymoronic. And I know that Lee and I, I'm, I just have a piece that they're reading to be published is dealing with this uh, issue of, you know, wh how far can you go creatively and still be writing what's called nonfiction, if nonfiction means something that you're presenting as truthful and in an on honest, straightforward fashion. Uh, so that's, a, that, that's, a, that, that's an issue that just doesn't seem to get resolved. Uh, anywhere, and I've just been dealing with it. So, if you read creative nonfiction and, and they publish my latest piece, then let me, let me know what you think. <laughs> so, and Gerald's in the you're in the latest version, and that's an essay. Yes, they pub creative nonfiction just published his uh, latest piece in the latest issue. If anyone sees it, 
Well, thank you all for coming. We appreciate it all. And